China is urging Russia and Ukraine to resume talks, saying negotiation is the only viable way to resolve crisis and ultimately reach a comprehensive ceasefire. Now, this from a Beijing so-called position paper on the Ukraine crisis, which it has just released. So far, there's been no progress at the negotiating table. President Volodymyr Zelensky has said he is not interested in meeting Putin. For the civilians caught in the crossfire, that means the bloodshed and suffering brought on by the war has no apparent end. But for more, we are joined by Katrina Zelenko. She's the ambassador of Ukraine to Singapore. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us on this very important day. Certainly been a difficult 12 months for many Ukrainian people. I understand your family is in Ukraine right now. Could you tell us uh, how has the experience been for you personally and how you felt uh, when you watched the war break out a year ago from today? It's been uh, the most challenging year for Ukraine since the country gained its independence. We have uh, lost thousands of civilians, officially around 10,000, but we do not take into account those in the temporarily occupied territories, including 500 children that died as a result of artillery shellings and missile attacks. Ukraine has um, lost half of its critical infrastructure. Now it's one of the most mined countries of the world. It is quite a living hell for many Ukrainians. At the same time, the country has shown unprecedented resilience. The whole world admires um, the way Ukrainians resist the invasion. And um, if you look at uh, the um, map, you will see that our army could already liberate more than a half of territory seized by Russia since the beginning of the invasion. Mm -hmm. We keep fighting and we keep standing strongly, but of course it is uh, quite a challenge also for my loved ones. It is heartbreaking to talk to your uh, family if you hear their voices from the basement where they have to hide uh, because there is air raid sirens. In fact, we had 15,000 air raid sirens over the last year. Yeah, it's been an incredibly disruptive war to, to the whole of Ukraine. Millions have fled and millions have been uh, displaced internally. Embassies usually track their citizens and support their citizens when they are abroad. What has that been like for, for your office, for your colleagues, uh, with so many Ukrainians forced to flee? Yes, it was quite a big deal for everyone, as everyone has his uh, parents, his uh, sisters, brothers back home. And of course, we have been staying all the time in touch with our loved ones in order to provide all the necessary help. But of course, we had to take care of our community. Mm -hmm. Those uh, Ukrainians living in Singapore who also would like to bring their parents from the most uh, difficult um, regions in Ukraine who suffered from that aggression. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been always in touch with them and I'm incredibly grateful to so many members of our community for helping us, for supporting us, for providing humanitarian assistance. As we all realize, we are in the same boat. We need to support one another. And speaking of uh, support and help, um, uh, Ukraine friends have poured in uh, a considerable amount of money, also weapons, uh, in, its, uh, in your country's fight for survival. Have they been adequate? Have they been um, timely? Uh, what more can be done? A very good point. I think timeliness is the bottom line here. We are grateful to so many countries who provided their military assistance to Ukraine. We need to uh, make it clear we need weapons for peace. We do not need them for war. Ukraine is a country that wants to stop this war as soon as possible. As it is on our soil, we keep losing our people. We keep losing our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, we need more. And um, we have seen that during the year 2022, we could uh, unlock many political decisions on uh, weapon deliveries. Now, Ukraine is getting artillery, MLRS, uh, wide range. Uh, equipment, but still there is much more that can be done in order to turn the tide and to start the counteroffensive. As we do not only have to withstand this aggression, we also have to liberate our territories. Yeah, and push Russia back. Uh, what's your assessment on, we know that NATO and the US have been providing the bulk of support uh, for Ukraine, uh, but what about from Asia, in particular with regard to the Ukraine sort of ASEAN relationship, is there more that Asia could be doing? I think a very good example um, and clear evidence was the vote in the United Nations General Assembly. If you look at the display, you will see that not a single country in Asia except North Korea voted against this resolution. Mm -hmm. 
which means that we are on the same page because mm. as in Asia, Ukraine rejects the notion of uh, zones of influence. This is something we are fighting against. We really want to show that if we do not protect the UN Charter and the rules-based order, the territorial integrity and respect towards them in Ukraine, tomorrow no one can feel safe. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that vote, uh, roughly three quarters of the member states endorsed it, seven against, but 32 abstained. What's your reaction when you see countries around the world, including uh, democracies that are playing both sides and not fully committed to condemning or sanctioning Russia? I think we need to stay uh, on the line that it is all about our worldview. It's all about our vision and the question that everyone has to put to himself. Are we going to live in the world where the might is right, mm -hmm. or we choose the world where all the players abide by the rules, respect one another, and we can ensure a secure environment for the new generations to come? I think the answer is clear. Mm -hmm. And we saw over the last few days that uh, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, is sort of blaming the West for instigating or, or for starting this war. What would be your response? Nothing new. Uh, actually, um, this is the way and quite a cornerstone of Russian propaganda. If you look at the uh, whole history of uh, Russia's imperialism, it's always like that. If you want to start the war, find a pretext. If you need a pretext, find the enemy. If you do not have any, make up one and start fighting against him tirelessly. That's how it happened with Ukraine. That's why we need to show um, to the world and to Russia, first of all, that the change of waters by force will not be tolerated. We live in the world where there are certain rules that have to be uh, always uh, working. And that is something that we in Ukraine show now. And that's why it is so important to bring the perpetrator to account after we have liberated our territories. That's why Ukraine applied for the case in the ICJ, and we are now working with our partners at establishment a special tribunal mm. for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. That would be the most viable way to show that um, that's the only option that it is. If you have uh, blatantly violated the international law, you will one day be brought to account. Mm. And Ambassador, I would also want to touch on the prospect of a peace in Ukraine. And there are realists out there who say that in order to uh, prevent further bloodshed, to bring quick end to this war, um, Ukraine may need to make some concessions, uh, cede territories if that's one of the options. What do you say to them? I think um, we have seen over the last nine years of Russia's war against Ukraine, that was started by Russia in 2014 with occupation of Crimea. After that, Russia instigated the war in Donbas. And we've been negotiating within the Minsk format. Normandy countries um, met in order to, to seek the ways to bring peace closer. Instead, we all have seen that um, um, the lack of response, the lack of um, um, sanctions has emboldened Russia just to forge ahead. And uh, now the country started an all-out invasion uh, against Ukraine. So this is the result. Appeasement, this is something that never works with the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. well, central to galvanizing support for Ukraine has been President uh, Zelensky's efforts. Can you tell us more about the man himself? Uh, his path to presidency, certainly an unusual one as a comedian and actor, more used to sort of political satire than to, to leading a political agenda. If you look at the recent surveys, there is a huge support within the population for the president, for our armed forces. We all have seen that the president has shown a real leadership, how it has to be the very first days of uh, invasion, when he uh, realized that it is up to him, the whole world will look at him and how he acts in this situation. Mm -hmm. And that is something that he managed in a perfect way, being able to consolidate the society in Ukraine to, to consolidate Ukrainians behind him, but also the whole world. We have seen 141 countries are standing with Ukraine. Mm. And Ambassador, even as your country is fighting against Russians, we know that uh, you're big on and powering ahead on rebuilding the country's economy as well as infrastructure. How is the process going? Uh, what sort of uh, big plans do you have going forward? This is a mass, mass task. Indeed. Um, after... Um, the war is over and Ukraine prevails, we will become 
quite a big reconstruction project in Europe. I think the largest one since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And this is also the largest by territory country of Europe. And uh, we have already started that. Of course, it will require a lot of time and a lot of resource. Um, if you look at statistics, 77,000 of uh, civilian infrastructure facilities have been destroyed or damaged, um, which means that we will have to rebuild a lot. And uh, many businesses, governments, companies who have a clear right view understand that this is a good investment in the future because we're dealing with a country that is one of the guarantors of the food security, uh, one of the countries that can provide uh, the world with good uh, uh, cutting-edge IT solutions, one of the biggest IT hubs. Uh, and even now, despite the war, Ukraine remains uh, within top five of suppliers of food products. Mm -hmm. We could um, deliver within 2022 more than 50 million tons of agricultural products to the world, which is now um, a very important thing. This is crucial because according to the recent estimates, around 20, 222 million people are um, acutely food insecure, which means that Ukraine has to um, commit to its um, obligations as one of the biggest suppliers of essential food products. Yeah, so it does point to the fact that Ukraine has a, a big role to play for all of us uh, that sort of watching this from the outside. Do you have a a misconception about the war that you've encountered that you'd like to put straight? We just got a, a minute or so before we finish this interview. I think it is always important to understand that this is not a distant war. We live in a globalized world. It is uh, not acceptable to um, split the blame for the war between the victim and the aggressor. It's like black and white. One country invaded another one. And if we look at the magnitude of this international armed conflict, we realize that only a global response is required to bring peace closer and to stop the war. Ambassador Zelenko, uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for coming in. We've been speaking to Ambassador Katrina Zelenko, Ambassador of Ukraine to Singapore.